Okay, all right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's seminar, which is already the last one of the limited series. Um, on, behalf, on behalf of all the organizers, we'd like to thank you all for your support. And to those that have filled out a survey about whether um, the, uh, the series should continue or not, um, the responses so far have been overwhelmingly positive and we're uh, in discussion about the next steps. So we'll for sure keep you posted and uh, feel free to sign up on our email subscription list, uh, which is uh, listed here in the bottom, uh, if you're interested to hear more about uh, further updates. Now, if you have uh, missed the previous seminars, we have now uploaded on our YouTube channel, the previous talks where uh, wherever we have obtained speaker information uh, permission. So feel free to check them out uh, if you're interested in the previous seminar. Um, just a quick reminder, I think everyone knows by now about Zoom etiquette. Uh, mute yourself during the seminar and type your questions in the uh, in the chat. We will have a Q&A at the end of the seminar, and, uh, and Morn has also uh, agreed generously to stay behind for a little bit uh, to answer more questions in a more informal uh, manner. So with that, I'm going to um, share my screen and we'll invite uh, Morn to share his screen as I introduce him. Okay. Thanks. So today's speaker uh, is Dr. Morin uh, Berkovich. And uh, he is an associate professor of mechanical engineering and uh, heads the fluidic technology lab at Tight Neon Israel Institute of Technology. He's equally interested in understanding basic phenomena associated with the physics and chemistry of fluids, as in leveraging this understanding to create new tools and new capabilities across a wide range of applications. Some of his recent contributions are in the fields of advanced manufacturing, freeform optics in space, manufacturing, microfluidics, and biomech uh, biochemical analysis. And with that, uh, Warren, it's all yours. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Cindy. I hope uh, you see the, the shared screen. And uh, thanks for thanks for putting together this, this nice series. And thanks for having me in mind and inviting me uh, to speak. It's uh, it's already allowed me to connect with some people that uh, I haven't uh, I haven't seen haven't chatted with uh, in a while. So good to see here some familiar faces. Um, I want to invite everyone who feels comfortable with it. Turn on your videos, your your cameras. It's just a lot nicer to talk to actual people and not the not the black squares. Uh, those of you who are on the West Coast and still in pajamas, you don't have to, but still still okay. Uh, I think the recording actually records just the one who's speaking at the, the time. Um, okay, let's uh, let's uh, let's dive in. Um, I uh, my my lab is the fluidic technologies uh, laboratory um, in Israel. I I come from a from a fluids background. Actually, I'm an aerospace engineer by by training. Um, and uh, then went into the, the dark side of, of analytical chemistry and microfluidics uh, lab on a chip during, uh, during my PhD with, uh, with Juan Santiago at, uh, at Stanford. Um, and, and these days uh, I'm somewhere in between. So my lab is really focused on fluid mechanics. That's, uh, that's my forte. Uh, and we apply it to various, uh, various applications, various fields. One of my current passions, which you can see in the videos uh, on the left, is is doing fluid mechanics in in microgravity. Um, I can, uh, if you're a funding agency, I'll tell you a lot of reasons why you should do that. But between us and the community, I'll tell you it's just a lot of fun. Uh, so we do experiments in parabolic flights, and we do experiments on the International Space Station. Um, another another uh, recent focus in the lab is using. Uh, fluids, liquids to create uh, optical components. Um, and there's actually um, a, a common ground between that and, and microfluidics, uh, where we're using uh, fluids to shape uh, liquid surfaces. And, and that relates to what I'm going to discuss today of uh, changing geometries in real time, changing flow fields uh, in real time. And so that's the uh, other part of, of my lab. And uh, I see Ofik here, one of my current students who is uh, uh, working on these aspects of how do we uh, control flow fields and topographies at the at the micro scale. Since I know I'm going to run out of time, uh, then I first uh, want to start with a thank yous. And uh, and and the, the many thanks here go to 
uh, my generations of students are going to see here work from the past uh, four, maybe even even five uh, five years. Um, and some of the main people are are, uh, are Yevgeny Boyko, who's uh, who's now uh, he went for a postdoc at Princeton, is now back in Israel as uh, as a prof, um, and Vesna, who's now a postdoc uh, at Cornell, uh, Valeri, who was a postdoc at MIT and now took a position um, at, uh, at BU, uh, Federico. Uh, who's now at uh, at ETH uh, Zurich, um, and and to my uh, my collaborators, uh, this is the one of the greatest things, the greatest funds of being a professor is working with great students and and great collaborators and learning from them. Um, a lot of the work you'll see here is uh, in collaboration with Govin Kaigala. He's now at uh, at UBC, previously at uh, at IBM, um, and with Amir Gat, my colleague at uh, at the Technion, a lot of the the theoretical things uh, you're going to you're going to see. So uh, this is this talk is is geared primarily towards uh, towards students. I'm gonna kind of teach a little bit, uh, but also show um, our our interest and in, and in, uh, and vision and uh, kind of the front line, some of the things that. Uh, there, okay, uh, I got muted for a second, but I think it's okay now. Uh, all right, um, let's, uh, let's, let's dive into it. So the story for me starts really with uh, frustration. <laughs> and so I, I worked a lot with these type of microfluidic chips um, and, and they're great. And I built a lot of my career on these, uh, on these microfluidic chips, but they're really frustrating. Um, one of the greatest frustrations is the way that we, we create them, right? So we go to, regardless if this is, you know, in silicon or in, or in glass, uh, or, uh, in plastics and even, even in paper, we create a geometry and the functionality of the chip is directly coupled, is married to that geometry. And if we want to change the functionality, then it means going back to whatever fabrication process uh, we had. And, and if, it's, if it's lithography, it's a big pain, uh, you know, to, to change that functionality and, and do something, something new. And so we like to call it a uh, lab on a chip, but actually, you know, honestly, between us, we're still pretty far from lab on a chip. This is closer to, you know, maybe a protocol on a chip. We design a certain protocol, we can run it. Um, but it's very different from a lab, right? In a lab, we run an experiment. We don't know a priori the result we're going to get. And based on what we're getting, we're deciding on the next step on the next experiment. And we don't really have these degrees of freedom in, in microfluidics, at least not in, in what we call continuous phase microfluidics, right? So, uh, so micro channels. There is another category um, in, in microfluidics, which, which you're all familiar with, which is in, in discrete phase, uh, for example, in, in digital microfluidics. And there, actually, we have um, a lot more programmability. Um, it's kind of built into to, to the technology where uh, droplets can be moved around, uh, protocols can be created, but also real-time decisions can be um, can be made in order to alter the the experiment, um, but not everything can be done in droplets. There are a lot of assays that are compatible with with droplets and can be discretized, but a lot that cannot. You know the the one the field that I come from separations and like phoresis and isotachyphoresis. That's something you can't do in discrete phase, and that's just one one example. Now, what I said is uh, is only partly true. You should all, you know, uh, jump up uh, saying, "Wait, what about uh, what about these things? Uh, things like uh, quake valves, other types of, of valves for controlling microfluidic channels?" Well, yes, absolutely. These these are probably the front line still after so many years of reconfigurable uh, microfluidics, and and maybe they're a great example of this point that being able to change the functionality in real time is so important because really so much uh, has come out and, and so many discoveries uh, came out uh, from this technology. But um, I wanna fantasize on, on, on more than that. And, and the fantasy that I want to 
invite you to uh, to join me in is, is is a greater vision of reconfigurable microfluidics. I, imagine that at some point we'll be able to take a microfluidic chip, uh, connect it to the computer by USB, and draw or you know assemble the microfluidic functionality we're interested in, press a button and presto have it um, at, uh, immediately, not go through a fabrication process and, and more importantly, be able to change that in real time based on what we see in, in, in our experiment. And, and something like that could be useful you know, in a wide range uh, of, of applications. I come from, from biosensing, so a lot of my uh, inclination is uh, is towards uh, that, but uh, if you look at things like single single style analysis, uh, imagine the ability not only to capture cells, but to capture them and merge them on demand and isolate them um, and then let them interact with other cells and then maybe pull them out and have all of that um, dynamically. Um, and, and so I'll make the distinction between a, a static uh, microfluidic chip, which is uh, what we uh, what we're most familiar with, um, configurable, where uh, there are works in, on configurable uh, devices, for example, the Lego uh, type devices, you can take different elements and put them together. Um, and that's extremely useful not to have to go through long iterations to create something, uh, but it's still uh, not adjustable in, in real time. And what I would love to have at some point is true reconfigurability like I described it here. Now, if anyone's expecting at the end of the talk for me to have the microfluidic device that does all of this, I don't. I want you to actually join me uh, in understanding the potential of this and maybe uh, you can come up uh, with other physical mechanisms um, that could implement this. I'm going to show you our, our attempts and some are successful, some are not. We learned a lot uh, along, uh, along the way, and, and this is something that uh, we continue pushing, uh, pushing forward. So, um, so for some of you, the next part is going to be trivial. Those of you who are coming from uh, the field of electrophoresis or, or electrokinetics, um, but maybe for some of the students uh, in the audience, this is new. So. Just uh, a quick recap on electric double layers um, and electro electroosmotic flow. Uh, so, if you take almost any almost any surface, uh, let's say uh, a glass a glass surface for convenience, but this really happens on on almost any surface. Um, if you take a glass surface and you bring it in contact with uh, with water, then spontaneously the glass deprotonates. It's like a, it's a, it's a weak acid. Uh, maybe even can be considered a, a strong acid at, uh, at reasonable pHs. And the glass uh, deprotonates, throws a proton to the water and becomes negatively, negatively charged. And again, this happens completely spontaneously. Um, and so now the, the, the wall is, is charged with, in this case, negative charge. And then this negative charge does the only thing that the charge knows how to do, which is create an electric field that goes into, into the liquid. And that electric field brings in positive, positive ions in the liquid. Those could be the same protons that, we, that were just released or other positive ions in, in our electrolyte, which shield uh, the, the negative charge. And this is where the electric field gets eaten up. Uh, this layer of, of charge is called the electric double layer. Its typical size is between say 10 and 100 nanometers for uh, typical common, common electrolytes. Um, but the important thing is that the charges in the, in the wall, in the glass are immobile. They can't move anywhere, but the chargers in the, in the liquid, in the electric double layer are mobile. And so if we, can, if we put an electric field parallel uh, to the wall, then we are applying a force to these charges. Uh, they begin to move and through viscosity, they pull the rest of the liquid with them. And this is called electrosmotic flow. Again, like I mentioned, for some of you, this is, this is trivial, 
but for those who are not coming from electrokinetics, I want to bring everyone um, to the same to the same page. If you have uh, if you take a micro channel, so here's a two dimensional sketch, a cross section of, of a micro channel, and you fill it with water. Uh, and actually, uh, water without an electrolyte would do just fine, uh, but generally with, with an electrolyte, and you apply an electric field along uh, the channel, then you're creating electrosmotic flow, which has this very nice characteristic of also having a, a plug shape. So anywhere outside the double layer, which is only a few nanometers uh, big, the flow is nice and uniform, and follows what's known as the helmholtz Molokovsky uh, velocity, which is proportional to the electric field we're, we're applying the zeta potential um, of the, of the um, surface and uh, inversely proportional to the, to the viscosity. And, and these, uh, these flows are very convenient in, in microfluidics uh, because they're very easy to, uh, to implement. They give us nice uh, plug flows, which uh, don't disperse our sample. But, but uh, in reality, uh, we actually don't always or rarely have really uniform zeta potential, or uniform charge um, on the surface. So to see what non-uniform charge does, let's, let's go to, to an extreme case. Let's imagine that uh, somehow we have a magical coating that suppresses completely the surface charge on uh, one part of the part of the channel. So the left is negatively charged, the right is completely neutral. And let's say we apply an electric field along uh, along this channel. So once again, the the part that uh, is charged has a double layer. Uh, we apply an electric field. Everything begins to move. You can think of the walls as, as conveyor belt that are they are moving liquid here in this case from left left to right. But then here on the right side. Uh, there's no conveyor belt because there's no there's no surface surface charge, but mass has to be conserved. Right, flow is coming from left to right, uh, has to continue some somehow, um, and what the the liquid does is it forms a pressure. There's an internal pressure that forms uh, in the channel, and what that pressure does is that it pushes the liquid on the on the right, and we get this type of Poiseuille flow. But of course, pressure also pushes in the other direction. So it pushes against the electroosmotic flow. And, and magically, there is a pressure where the area under the curve, so the mass flux on the right-hand side, equals exactly the mass flux on the left-hand side, mass and mass is, uh, mass is conserved. So anytime you have non-uniform um, zeta or non-uniform electroosmotic flow, you are getting um, internal pressure. Now, this is this is well known, um, and the the uh, references on the bottom here are just some of the references who uh, the, who study this. And this is usually because people people hate this, right? People want to get rid of non-uniformities in zeta potential, uh, because if you're running, let's say, an electrophoresis experiment where you're trying to to separate some species, then the last thing you want is pressure in your system, which causes the parabolic flow and and dispersion. Uh, of your peaks, it reduces resolution. So people study this, you know, they mostly to understand it and and then get uh, get rid of it. Um, this this was our starting point. So so these are the lemons, and and we wanted to see whether we can uh, we can make some lemonade out of non-uniform electrosmotic flow. And actually, all you need to do is move away from a a one-dimensional or or unidirectional in a in a channel flow, and go to uh, three-dimensional, or let's call it two-and-a-half-dimensional flow. Um, so we, we started looking at uh, Healy Shaw flow. Flow, sorry. Um, Healy Shaw flow is a flow between two parallel plates uh, that are that have a small gap uh, between them. So if a typical size in uh, in plane is let's say on the order of centimeters then the gap between the plates is on the order of, let's say, a few tens of tens of microns. So a typical micro channel. So a very channel, uh, very shallow flow between two walls. And now imagine that you can pattern somehow, we'll get to how. Imagine you can pattern one of the walls or both of them with some zeta potential distribution. This is this is this splash here. Um, 
And uh, like I said, can be the, the lower part or the upper part here, zeta L and zeta, uh, zeta U. And now you apply an electric field uh, in one direction. You need direction, let's say in the, in the X direction, just like, uh, just like before. So I won't run you through the, 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 entire, the entire model. I'll just give you the gist of it. And the people responsible for this are, are uh, Evgeny, who I introduced before, uh, and, and Shimon Rubin. Um, if you take the Stokes equation and you depth average them in the Z direction here, you get to, to this equation uh, shown here, which is actually really intuitive. Um, what it says is that the average uh, planar velocity, this is the term here on the left, so in plane velocity is generated by what? On the right hand side, gradients of pressure, not a big surprise, gradients and pressure drive flow. And the other part is zeta potential. This is the average between the top and the bottom uh, when we do the depth averaging times an electric field, which is also not very surprising because the electric field uh, creates electrosmotic flow. Um, and that's the, that's the other part. Um, uh, and now th there's uh, a, a useful um, a mathematical trick that we're going to use later on. If you take the curl um, of this equation, then what you get is the vorticity, which is also the Laplacian of the stream function. And you get this electric field cross the gradient in zeta. And like I said, this is just a, uh, a, 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 a part that we're going to go get back to uh, later on. So just remember we have this, this trick. Okay, so let's go back to some physical uh, intuition. Let's take the simplest uh, geometry at least we could think of. Uh, let's look at a disk uh, that has a fixed zeta potential. And let's assume that the zeta potential everywhere else is zero. Exactly. Okay, completely an artificial, artificial problem. And we apply an electric field in the x direction. So let's let's think uh, what would happen, what we expect to happen in in this case. So um, on the uh, on the disk, we're going to have essentially a conveyor belt going from left to right. So there's going to be flow going from left to right. But just like in the one D problem, in the channel problem, here in the in the white area, there is no electrosmotic flow to continue taking uh, the liquid out. So we are going to have positive pressure forming on the right on the right hand side, and similarly on the left hand side. On the left hand side, the conveyor belt is pulling liquid from the left, but outside, what is supplying that that liquid? And and that's a negative pressure that is forming on the left. But unlike in the one dimensional problem, we we were constrained in in one dimension. Uh, this was a a two D or two and a half D problem, and pressure does not act in one direction, it pushes the liquid in all directions, which means that we can expect the positive pressure to start pushing the liquid, not only in X, but also in Y. If we plug this to uh, our equations, then uh, we get a solution that is precisely dipole flow. So the color map here is the pressure. So you can see positive pressure on the right and negative pressure on the left, like we expected. Inside the disk, we have uniform flow due to the electrosmotic flow. Um, and then outside, what's important is you get these, it's actually a precise, precisely dipole flow and an and, and, and indication so far, just theoretically, that using just uh, electric field only in the X direction, but non-uniform zeta potential, we can also get flow in the, in the Y direction. And for those of you who are perhaps coming from a, a fluid mechanics background, you know that a dipole is uh, a, a basic solution that you can construct other things out of. So it's a very basic uh, fundamental solution. So the, our first implementation for this to see whether the theory is, is right um, was, was using uh, chemical patterning. So this is, uh, this is work by uh, Federico Paratore. And now at, uh, now at ETH, and what he did is he took a, a, a glass slide and he patterned it, patterned it with a, a positive uh, poly electrolyte, this, uh, this PAH. Uh, we used the, the microfluidic probe, um, uh, was developed at, at IBM uh, Zurich to do that. So we can come in and essentially write a, this circle uh, nicely in the middle. Uh, now the rest of the surface is negatively charged. If it's, uh, if it's native glass, we tried um, to 
get as close as pop, uh, possible to the model. So we coat uh, the rest with uh, uh, with essentially PL, PLL peg to make it as neutral as possible. And that's our structure. We take this and just put it at the bottom of a standard uh, microfluidic chip. We take uh, fluorescent beads and the fluorescent beads, uh, we also coat with a PLL peg to make them as neutral as possible so that they would follow the flow and not the electric field. Um, and then um, and then we run the electric field, and I hope you can uh, see this clearly enough through the uh, through Zoom. Uh, but you get exactly exactly the dipole, so you can see the flow in, um, in the middle, and then flow going around um, uh, from the right back to back to the left. Now, one uh, other trick we can do is that we can apply positive pressure on the right channel. So now we're superposing the electroosmotic flow with pressure driven flow. And what you see is we're getting, this is also a classical solution in fluid mechanics. We're getting flow around a cylinder, right? So you can see the flow is bypassing the cylinder, um, not entering it and going only around. But the one thing to remember here is there is no cylinder, right? There's physically nothing uh, uh, obstructing the channel. It's just surface potential and yet we can get the flow to go around it. So that's when we started getting uh, interested in, hmm, okay, maybe we can actually use this to pattern flows, to, to create, to control the flow field in a more complex uh, complex way. So um, with, the, with this writing tool, if we can make a circle, then, uh, then we can create more complex things. So uh, we decided to write electroosmotic flow exclamation mark and exclamation mark is mostly to have this nice circle here the disc uh, the disc here uh, and when we apply an electric field then uh, this is the type of flow you you can get uh, and actually it matches very nicely with uh, with theory and don't ask me what it's good for it's absolutely useless it's just uh, cool and once you have uh, this tool this makes sense uh, to do. But uh, it, it shows you can pattern complex complex flows. However, um, you know we're striving for configurability and, and reconfigurability, and this validates the theory. But it's still a fabrication process, right? We go and we deposit, we write this, and it's fixed. It can't be can't be changed. Uh, so we wanted to try and do something that is more more dynamic. Um, and, and the next step, and, and this is uh, work that Federico continued, and then uh, Vesna came in and, um, and took over. And uh, we started doing this uh, using uh, field effect electrosmosis. This is a, a well-known uh, effect or, or phenomena. It's been well documented in, in other papers. Here are some of our references uh, for this work. Um, and uh, you know, dealing with the surface chemistry, like I, I, I discussed before, is is really tough for those who are doing surface chemistry. You know, you know, it's a pain. It works on Tuesdays, not necessarily on Thursdays, and and so on. Um, going with controlling the zeta potential with um, electrodes is is much more robust. Once you can get it to work, it it actually works again and again robustly. So, what's the principle here? the 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 idea is is very simple. We take again our substrate glass. We deposit um, electrodes on it here, just one one electrode, and on top of that electrode, we deposit a dielectric. I'm gonna get back to this dielectric. It's a very important part of uh, of the system. Um, what the dielectric does is that it, it ensures that we're doing basically only capacitive uh, charging. We don't have any currents going into the uh, into the electrodes, and this sits just at the bottom of a standard uh, microfluidic uh, channel. And so, if we if we go to the to the side view here here on the left, so here's the here's the electrode, and when we uh, apply voltage to that electrode. Then yes, of course we have a drop through the the dielectric, dielectric, but we induce a potential on the surface, um, and then we're uh, uh, doing by uh, by uh, uh, we're applying. I'm sorry, a desired voltage instead of the natural phenomena 
uh, of the wall the, the protonation instead of the chemical reaction. Um, but note that if we do this in a certain location, it's really not instead of the chemical reaction, it's in addition to the chemical reaction. And in other areas where uh, the, we don't have an electrode or if the electrode is turned off, then locally, we're still going to have the negative charge of the surface. Now, you can go to a low enough pH so that the channel, the, the, the wall doesn't really deprotonate, but that limits you. Then, then you're really low, low pHs. Um, a nice trick to overcome that is the AC part. So I mentioned field effect electrosmosis. Our field effect is uh, using this electrode to induce uh, the potential. The AC part means that you're oscillating the potential. So if you're oscillating the potential, you're creating once a negative charge and once a positive charge. So if your electric field in the channel is uniform, is sorry, constant in one direction, you're going to have an oscillating electrosmotic flow, once to the left and once to the right. That's, that's not what we want. We want the constant electrosmotic flow in a desired direction. So what we can do is we can synchronize the electric field in the channel with the electric field on the electrodes. So that, for example, when the um, electrode uh, is charged positively, we're going to have an electric field to the right. And when the electrode is charged negatively, we're going to have an electric field to the left, creating low to the right. Um, so that's the that's the principle, and uh, um, like I said before, once it works, it's it's very robust. I'll, I'll run this this video now. You see, things are a lot cleaner than in the uh, uh, chemical patterning uh, mode. Here, one more advantage is that if you consider the uh, particles that we're throwing in, then the particles can be charged. The oscillating electric field is going to eliminate their effective uh, electrophoretic mobility. So you don't need to code them or anything. Um, you can see some disturbances due to dielectrophoresis on the, on the electrodes and capture them, but otherwise it's, uh, it's, it's pretty clean. Um, I wanna say uh, a word about the, the dielectric. I know there are a lot of students uh, who, are, who are watching this and, and I remember you know, as, as a student, I was to see, you know, profs giving talks and I always wondered how come things always work for them. Uh, well, that's because we, you know, cherry pick to show you all the things that work and don't show you all the hard work that is behind it. So I wanna show you the hard, dirty work behind making this work. This is, this is, uh, this is Vesna who spent uh, a year or a year and a half just on finding the part of my language, them dielectric, <laughs> because we thought it should work, but and we followed standard protocols for uh, dielectrics, which were mostly silicon oxide, and it kept breaking. The dielectric breakdown voltage was just too low. Um, I didn't mention this, but you need a couple hundred volts to run this to get sufficient potential on the on the surface, and things just broke again and again and again. At some point, it used to, it looked completely hopeless um, and, until we hit the right, uh, the right dielectric. Uh, so what you can see here is the breakdown strength for various dielectrics. Um, and what's very important to mention, and we did not know that at the, the beginning, is that it's not symmetric. Uh, it's, not, it's not the same if you're applying a positive or negative uh, potential to the dielectric. So some dielectrics that look fine in one direction break very quickly in the, the other in the other direction. Eventually, um, we converge to this uh, silicon oxonitride, about 500 nanometers, um, and that's it. It's actually a very very simple uh, clean room process. And once you have that, it's robust, very high yield. All the devices work. So uh, once we have a, one electrode, one dipole, we can start playing around with more. So here are some superpositions. Uh, this is a, uh, a two dipoles, uh, one next to the other, and then two dipoles, one on top of the other. You can uh, create uh, quadrupoles uh, and so on. So we started started playing around. Some of the other functionalities uh, uh, we could get is uh, look at this uh, two electrodes, one inside the other. So one is actually an annulus uh, around a disc. And if you run them at uh, opposite potentials, 
then what you get is the is that the mass flux of one equals exactly the other and you get internal circulations uh, without affecting the flow outside. So it's kind of a localized mixer. If you want to mix your flow at some point um, in your channel, you can put these two electrodes and, and mix them. Um, if you ground the central electrode, then you can get a flow around the cylinder. Uh, only this time, you don't need a pressure, pressure driven flow. Um, you just get this from electro electrosmotic flow. Um, and then you can place some, some more. Um, here is an, uh, here's an array of electrodes, a small array. This is a, a two by four uh, array where we have a flow that's initially a pressure driven flow from left to right undisturbed and, and it's going straight. This is when the voltage is zero now. And then when we apply the voltages, we can, we can curve um, the channel and this way, and then if we flip the voltages, we can change the we can change the phase, um, and and that start that starts resembling you know dynamic control of the flow field. And again, I think what's what's nice about it is there there are no walls here, right? This is all just by inducing inducing the flow. And just to just to show off with with the models, so uh, these are these are the experiments that I just showed and. Um, and this is what the model uh, predicts, just a simple dipole model, uh, predicts the flow very accurately, just uh, from first, uh, first principles. There are no fitting parameters uh, other than measuring the, the, zeta, the zeta potential. And again, we, 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 uh, we like the fact that this is a completely open channel with, uh, uh, with no walls. You can uh, combine this with uh, with devices with that, that do have walls. It's just a demonstration of a, a kind of sorter, a switch that you can implement using uh, electrosmotic flow. So things flow in the middle without the potential, and then you can uh, apply voltage uh, to uh, one of the electrodes or the other and divert the flow uh, up, uh, up or down. And the the response time is um, is is pretty quick. The electrical response time is the RC time of the of the circuit, um, and then the um, the other response time is the viscous time scale that it takes the information to travel from the bottom of the channel to to the top. Um, uh, this is on the order of, uh, of of milliseconds. Probably can be improved a little bit more. Uh, one more um, cool flow. Uh, flow field that, that we can get is um, is this one. Uh, what you see is uh, flow. Hope again, hopefully through Zoom, it's uh, it's clear enough. But what we have here is flow from right to left, left to right, right to left, and left to right. Right, so in opposite direction. Um, and so you should ask, okay, what's uh, what's the big deal? <laughs> to uh, uniform flows in opposite directions flowing in channels. Um, the, the big deal is that there are no walls here, right? So there are no separators between uh, the different streams. Uh, so we nickname it, you know, an impossible flow. Clearly it's possible. It's just impossible to get with pressure driven flow. There is no pressure configuration in which you can get uh, these type of flows. What we have here, is a series of electrodes. Uh, if the contrast is good enough on your screens, you can maybe see it in the background here. Um, uh, there's the, um, an array of electrodes uh, under each one of these uh, uh, streams. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, here zoomed in. So we have a bunch of uh, electrodes. Uh, between them, there are resistors that make sure that each electrode is in the right potential along the channel to create this type of uh, uniform uh, bi-directional uh, flow. Um, so we started playing with this bi-directional fl bi flow. It was uh, almost, almost by coincidence. We started throwing particles into this flow, some dyes and, and um, some beads. Um, and then we came across this uh, interesting, uh, interesting phenomena. So for those of you who are more on the uh, uh, analytical chemistry side of things. So far, I discussed more in the fluid fluid mechanics. Um, so, so this might might interest you. So, consider uh, this bidirectional flow that you know now how we can achieve. Um, and let's say that each of the streams has this width uh, w. So, let's say we throw in a, a particle 
this green particle with uh, relatively high diffusivity, what it's going to do, it's going to advect flow with the, uh, with the stream. But then uh, at some point, it's, uh, or all the time, it's going to diffuse. But uh, after a characteristic time of W squared over, over D, it's going to diffuse across the boundary with the other uh, stream. And once it does that, it will start flowing, flowing back. So if you if you equate the advective time scale with the diffusive time scale, you can get a characteristic length scale, a distance um, at which uh, this uh, green particle is going to stop and 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 go back. So we call this the penetration length. If you throw in uh, particles, how deep into the channel are they going to penetrate before they they go back? Now, if you throw a uh, lower diffusivity particle into the channel then it's going to do exactly the same thing, um, except that it's going to advect longer before it diffuses across to the other, other stream. And if your channel happens to be shorter than the penetration length of the red one, then you can separate them, right? You can uh, pull out the reds and, uh, and, and leave the greens. So um, here is a demonstration with, uh, with a dye. So we just uh, throw in a, uh, a neutral dye into, into the channel. And uh, you can see it in initially uh, was flowing to the right and then it stopped. And, and, and the movie's still, movie's still running. Uh, here it will repeat now. It's moving from left to right. Uh, and the red line indicates the front and the video keeps running, but the dye stopped. And the reason it stopped is because this is the characteristic length after which um, it uh, it meets the it crosses to the to the other channel. Uh, we can validate this penetration length um, according to the theory for the theory for different velocities, different width. It matches matches exactly. Um, and then uh, and this is a cool separation uh, process. Here we put the die, and now we throw also the beads. And you can see that the die stops. Here we set it to a shorter penetration length, so it stops uh, at the beginning early on. And then when you throw in the, the beads, you can see the beads are just shooting uh, through to the, to the other side. So this is a, essentially a continuous diffusion-based uh, diffusion separation. Uh, we did it for, for different species. Uh, this is an example of, um, let's say you want to label a very uh, a important uh, in, a antibody. In this case, uh, it's just a model antibody. Um, uh, but let's say you have something that is an extremely rare, extremely uh, low amount that you want to label, um, and you can't use a standard column uh, for it. Um, then you can throw it together with the um, with a dye, uh, mix it throw it into the left channel, apply the electric field. In this case, we have a double label. So it was uh, pre-labeled with Fitzy, so we can see it. And then we're labeling also with, uh, with Alexa Floor. And then what you see is that at the beginning of the, of the channel, this is the first millimeter of the channel, they, they are initially mixed. And then only the antibodies come out. And then if you look at the end of the channel, at the end of the channel, you don't have uh, any free dye. You have only the labeled antibodies and they're, um, and they're coming out. Um, so just an example of what this might be, might be useful uh, for. Uh, this is just quantitative, sorry. The same thing, uh, the dye concentration drops to zero, zero at the end. And of course, then you can play with, uh, with geometries. You can have uh, this uh, Y junction at the, at the edge. And so the things that come out uh, are actually extracted uh, on the other side. And so uh, we've looked at the extraction, for example, of, uh, of uh, DNA strands, uh, uh, long strands from short strands, and, and, and pulled them out on the, on the other side. Okay, um, so uh, we went uh, a bit to the side with looking at interesting uh, flows. So uh, we looked at these mixing flows and we looked at the bidirectional flows. Let's go to our original uh, desire, which is uh, to create arbitrary flows. And so if you remember at the beginning, I, uh, I tried to scare you with this, uh, with this equation. Uh, we got this from the depth average the equation for the flow. We took the curl and we got this. This is Laplacian of the stream function equals the electric field cross gradient in zeta. 
And if you take uh, the case of an electric field that is simply in the, in the x direction, uh, then this simply becomes electric field times the gradient of zeta in, in y, uh, which means that you can solve a very simple inverse problem, meaning that if you want to know what is the zeta potential required in order to create this stream function, all you need to do is integrate it in y and you have the zeta potential distribution. So for example, uh, here is a stream function. Uh, this stream function represents a y junction. So a stream function, uh, wherever you have a gradient in the stream function value, this is where we, you have flow. So it's uniform here, here, and here, and there's a gradient in between. So this is, this is a y junction. Um, if you take this, plug it into the equation and integrate, you get this theta potential uh, distribution that you need to implement in order to get this type of uh, type of flow. So now the question is, uh, okay, uh, we we are uh, will be able to achieve these type of flows if we can have a distributed uh, zeta potential. So uh, so far we have one electrode and we can create these type of uh, of dipoles. And the question is uh, how to get to an array. Uh, an array of electrodes. And there is no uh, you know, fundamental uh, challenge with this. If you, if you take um, several electrodes and connect them with, uh, with the leads to a pad and uh, run them, they work, we've, we've done it. And like I said, uh, it's, it's pretty robust. You saw before the bidirectional flow uh, had many electrodes and, and these, uh, uh, these devices, this device worked. So you can do it, but the problem is scaling. The, the problem is uh, how many uh, electrodes can you connect directly by wire before you run out of space? So with five by five, it's maybe okay. Um, if you wanna get to something that is high resolution, let's say hundred by hundred, um, it's not very feasible. Um, and now you can look at electronic solutions, uh, microelectronics, uh, works uh, well uh, at low voltages. If you're looking at five, 12 volt processes, uh, you, can, you can create devices that would have individual control. But when you're talking about hundreds of volts, which is what's required for electrosmotic flow, it's tough to find uh, these type of uh, uh, solutions. And so that brought us to look for a, a solution uh, that would allow us to uh, control devices uh, more easily. This is really uh, hot out of the oven. This was uh, not published yet. Uh, it's in press now in microsystems and nanoengineering. Um, and the idea is to decouple the control uh, from the high voltages. Um, and we do that by photo, photo actuation. So if you um, think of this type of gate with two electrodes, two electrodes um, and a photoconductive material uh, between them that when it is not illuminate, illuminated, it has very poor conductivity. Um, and when it's illuminated, um, it has pretty good conductivity. Then you can toggle, you can switch simply by illuminating uh, from an external source. You don't have to have the electronics uh, on board. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's what we do. Um, we uh, designed the chips now uh, with photoconductive materials uh, as switches for each of the uh, electrodes. And then we apply an external uh, illumination with LEDs or a DMD projection to control, uh, control each of them. I see uh, we're running out of time, so I'll skip some of the, of the technical details. Um, uh, but there, there are two main uh, options. One is amorphous silicon. One is uh, zinc, zinc oxide. They have slightly different uh, processes. They both work, uh, work well. Uh, one is more sensitive to the wavelength, and that can be an advantage if you want to image with one wavelength and, and actuate uh, with another. The other one is more broad, uh, broad spectrum. Uh, we can analyze and look at the, their breakdown. But there's a nice, a convenient uh, work point and um, uh, here you can see some of the examples. These are still small arrays, and, but these are entirely controlled uh, by illumination. So uh, each one of these is controlled with uh, an LED 
uh, that decides whether it's on uh, on or off. Uh, so right now, this is uh, still a small array, uh, three by three by three. Um, and now we're working on uh, on expanding this and really creating a high resolution uh, electrosmotic uh, flow flow device. Um, I'll, uh, I'll I'll finish by uh, by sharing uh, a recent collaboration with uh, uh, Herb uh, Shea at uh, at EPFL, um, and he's been uh, developing uh, these uh, actuators. Um, currently, they're on on millimeter scale; they're not micro scale yet. Um, but uh, these uh, actuators that actually also work on a, a, a dielectric uh, principle where there's snapping between these two electrodes that pushes uh, a, a liquid that then deforms this membrane. Uh, they've been developing it for soft uh, robotics, soft actuation, uh, haptics, um, dynamic braille, things like, uh, things like that. Um, and uh, they run into very similar uh, challenges of how do you control an array since these also require very high, uh, high voltages. So um, uh, Herb's group is now working hard on miniaturizing and shrinking their actuators so that maybe we could use them for, for microfluidics. Um, and at the same time, we try to use our technology on their existing uh, uh, millimeter scale uh, actuators to see if we can uh, provide that level of control. So, and I'll skip here the the scheme just to show you the uh, the, the cooler videos. So here you can see an array of five by five uh, uh, hexal actuators, um, and you can see the light pattern. Um, and uh, as soon as you illuminate uh, the photoconductive switches, you get the response from the uh, from the actuators. Uh, and if you take this entire surface and put a membrane on top of it, then um, you can start moving things things around. So this is just a, a marble uh, on top of the surface and we're, we're actuating it. Everything again is controlled with light uh, and, and we can move it around. So this is still on a centimeter, centimeter scale, uh, but my hope is that uh, if Herb's group is successful in miniaturizing this, then we're going to have a microfluidic device where the surface can be controlled in real time. And that starts getting uh, very close to our vision of a configurable and reconfigurable uh, microfluidic device. Uh, here's the, this is just an, an artist impression, but this is what we hope to get, right? So we have this, this array of actuators and we will illuminate them uh, with a screen on uh, in the desired spots and create channels we we're interested in and change those uh, dynamically. Um, I'll, I'll finish just by, by saying that there are many more physical mechanisms to, to explore. And uh, we like to divide them into to two categories. One is virtual boundaries. Virtual boundaries is what I showed you with electrosmotic flow. Um, there's no, uh, there are no walls. You're just uh, controlling the flow. Um, and you can do it uh, with uh, electrohydrodynamics, like I showed you, uh, or magnetohydrodynamic thermocapillary flow is actually something we are working on to create these type of flows. Uh, acoustic waves and these, the other category of physical boundaries, where one example are the actuators that I just uh, showed you. Uh, but, uh, but you can look at things that are more perhaps on the actually chemistry side of things, phase transition uh, of, the, of the boundaries. Um, and uh, we, we uh, invite you to, to read our, our review on this on reconfigurable microfluidics. Um, we published, uh, published last year that gives kind of overview and, and, and uh, points to uh, technologies that already started developing things that are uh, configurable and reconfigurable and where we think uh, they are promising, uh, promising directions. Uh, with that, uh, I think uh, I think we're out of time, so I'll I'll stop here. But I'm uh, more than happy to uh, to take uh, take questions, and and I'm here to stay around. Thanks very much. Hey, thank you so much, Mara. This is wonderful. I think we have quite a lot of questions in chat. Uh, the first one is from Julia. Do you, Julia, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Sure. I think maybe the last slide kind of um, gave me a preview of answer to the first part of this question, but um, I'm curious for the reconfigurable microfluidics of the future, do you think that they're going to be combinations of uh, those different modules or 
like everything we saw today was electrokinetically driven and I think, you know, kind of points to the possibility that it could be entirely electrokinetically driven. Um, yeah. yeah the, what, what do you think about that? The, the answer, unfortunately, maybe it's going to be a common theme to my answers is, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I tend to think that there is no single single solution. I think I think in this community also, we, we looked for the solution for some time. We tried, you know, analogies with microelectronics. Doesn't work. Chemistry and biology is just too complicated. So I don't think there's, there's one solution. And that's why I think there should be more people working on on reconfigurability now it's not the only challenge right i mean reconfigurability is one thing but sensors and being able to you know measure things everywhere distributedly is is, is also a challenge um so i i don't think there's there's one solution uh, maybe I'll, I'll i'll um you know i'll use your question to share another part of the vision you know we talk a lot about ai these days and it's kind of on the mm -hmm. on the computer science side of things and and we all you know chat with chat gpt and so on um and, and, and AI can do a lot of uh, analysis uh, for in, in chemistry and biochemistry and so on. But imagine AI running an experiment, right? Uh, you set it uh, set off and it runs your experiment. Now it can do all the analysis these days. I'm sure someone can program you know to analyze single cell uh, and so on. but it doesn't have hands. You know, what are the degrees of freedom for the AI to actually change the configuration and run the experiment? Currently, it's crippled. It has no degrees of freedom. So with, with reconfigurability, I, I, I want to give more degrees of freedom so we can uh, be more creative in what we can do or the AI can do. That makes sense. Um, and the related kind of second part of my question, because I, I, I think about the impacts of dual heating quite a bit um, from, you know, a single cell protein separation. Um, uh, perspective, but um, wh where do you see some of the challenges coming up uh, for some, you know, bioassays in the reconfigurable microfluidics, especially when you have certain assay chemistries that are just very conductive and will produce, you know, large amounts of joule heating? What, what do you think is the way around? Yeah, that? it's a great, great, uh, great practical question. With um, so, so the uh, with electrokinetics, of course, you always have to be worried worried uh, about that. Um, the electric fields that we used here to get, you know, the standard flows that we get are on the other 100 volts per centimeter, which is uh, we didn't see any excessive uh, excessive heating. Um, we do this standardly also with other assays. So in this case, not a big concern. Uh, also, since the channels are very shallow. Uh, then we're creating, uh, uh, we're, we're uh, dissipating uh, heat from the surface. So sure. we did not see big issues here, but of course it's something to be concerned about. With electrokinetics, I didn't have time you know, to discuss all of it, but my greater concern is, uh, is, is changes in electrosmotic flow mm -hmm. due to interaction with biospecies. So mm -hmm. with things sticking to the surface and then killing your electrosmotic effect, that's the biggest killer here. That makes sense. Hey, thank Thanks you. For Thanks for the questions. Uh, the next question is from Sangu. Sangu, can you unmute and ask your question? Sangu, are you here? Okay, maybe I'll ask his question uh, in the yeah. meantime. Uh, Sangu is asking, are the coatings for masking EOF biocompatible? And for bidirectional flow, the setup looks similar to that of Kelvin Hempel's uh, instability on largest scale. Were you able to observe instability with high electric fields? Um, yeah, we didn't, we didn't try to push it. I'll start with the second part. I, we didn't try to push it towards uh, towards instability. Um, I guess you, you can get a lot of type a lot of types of instabilities when you crank up the voltage. Uh, one electrokinetic instabilities due to a, a charge accumulation. Uh, you can get the thermal thermal effect. So we honestly we didn't investigate it um, in that direction. Um, in terms of the coding, so we're not 100% hundred percent sure what uh, uh, what aspect you meant. One were the coatings we used for the chemical coating without the AC field effect electrosmosis, 
Um, those are, you know, peg type coatings. They're, they are biocompatible, so there are no issues with them. Um, with the uh, dielectric that we used for uh, in the field effect, uh, silicon oxonitride, also uh, no issues in terms of this uh, damaging any biomolecules, but the biomolecules like to stick to it um, and change the electrosmotic flow. And so the problem is on, on that side, like I, uh, I mentioned in my response to Julia. Also, we should note that Sungu is in the clean room currently, according to his message in chat. So. Okay. <laughs> I hope I, I answered your question, Sungu. <laughs> Thank you. And then the next question is from Nick Castano. Do you want to mute? Uh, yeah, hi. Thank you for the talk. It was a, really interesting. I was just wondering, um, what do you imagine are some of the limits in uh, resolution that you can get with these uh, photoactuated electroosmotic arrays? Uh, so, I, like the light projection um, size, I don't imagine is the limit. You're pretty small, um, but it, I think the gap between the electrodes, um, there's got to be some sort of minimum gap that you can have between them, and uh, also the electrode sizes. So, like basically, how close can we get to shaping fluid flow, like you could get with pressure-driven flow in walls of a channel? Yeah, so I think there are two limitations. Um, one, one limitation is really the gap between the electrodes, like you, you mentioned, um, uh, where we're going to have uh, a breakdown uh, through, through this uh, gap. And, and again, we're talking about hundreds, hundreds of voltages, hundreds of volts, sorry, um, over these gaps. Order of magnitude, um, microns. And so I don't know if one micron, maybe on the order of five, we've gotten to five uh, and, and, and we survived it. We really didn't try to push to, to one. So it's on that order of magnitude. There is, however, another limitation, at least um, in the theoretical limit that I showed. And that has to do with the height of the channel. So uh, it's not that we won't get electrosmotic flow. We will get electrosmotic flow with uh, close electrodes. Um, but, uh, but you need to consider what is, whether your problem really is two-dimensional or, or not. So if the height of the channel now starts being uh, too high with respect to variations uh, in plane, then you cannot assume that uh, you're shallow and lubrication approximation, all of that. So uh, you need to run a more you know, complex three-dimensional problem. You've got electrosmotic flow, but not exactly the one we predict here. Yeah, also, just going off of that, have you um, worked with any viscous fluids? Um, oh, I imagine using water for most of these experiments. So what have you run into some limitations with the viscosity of fluids that you can drive through your setups? Uh, we haven't actually. So we, we stay very, you know, aqu aqueous <laughs> centered uh, because most assays uh, use that. I mean, we had viscosity changes due to uh, DNA that, that, that we threw in, but at that level, um, I don't know that it's measurable. There were still low concentration. So the answer is we, we haven't tested it. Uh, the, the theory, which seems to be uh, well validated here, uh, suggests that this is simply inversely uh, proportional to viscosity since we're driving everything with electrosmotic flow. So you'll just get velocities that are inversely proportional to your viscosity. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be really interested to see this applied to blood for cell separation or plasma separation. I think that's a would be a very um, cool application of this stuff. Yeah, I think uh, like I said before the 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 main challenge I think is uh, is stuff sticking sticking to the to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Yeah, other questions. Great, thank you. So I just want to make a quick note that we're four minutes past the hour, so I'm going to end here and stop the recording. But uh, let's thank Warren again for the fantastic talk. Uh, we're very honored to have you to give the seminar for the last one of the series. And uh, and then please uh, do stay behind us and gather a few more questions from people. Okay, so we'll stop. The sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks again for inviting me. And yeah, I'm uh, I'm staying around and now I expanded the uh, the screen and I can see everyone here. So, hey, Tom and hey, Juan.